In this video, we're going to talk about base compensation. There's so much to think about here and it's high stakes for sure. So keep listening to hear from an expert. Hi there, I'm Andrea Adams and the host of HR Shop Talk. On this show, you get expert insight into all things HR. I encourage you to subscribe to the show by clicking on the button at the bottom of the screen, or you can subscribe to the podcast to keep learning from my smart and experienced guests. Today, my guest is David Pan. David is a leader in global compensation and analytics. David started out in consulting, but now has been working in mining and shipping. Hi, David. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Andrea. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. It's a very technical topic and someone who can uh, break it down would be is very helpful. So just to open the conversation about compensation, can you talk about the purpose of compensation in general? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when you really think about it, what compensation is meant to do is to attract and retain employees, right? At the mm-hmm. end of the day, Uh, People need to make a living and um, they need to uh, have a a competitive pay to, first of all, enter the door, um, but also you want to offer a competitive pay so that they won't leave and and Mm -hmm. look for other opportunities. Um, Now, one thing sort of related to this question um, that I want to touch on is I want to sort of dispel a myth that or a thought that we may have that, you know, compensation is related to someone's effort or job difficulty or how smart someone is. Um, I don't think that there is a a strong correlation. I, in fact, I feel that, you know, there are a lot of smart individuals out there, a lot of hardworking individuals out there um, that, you know, aren't necessarily paid very high. Mm -hmm. What I do think in a good compensation program, what, what compensation will do is there should be a correlation to overall responsibility and accountability in pay. Okay. Um, and pay. And so uh, I thought I'd just throw that nugget in there as a little bit of a, a brain teaser or, or a right. thought for yeah. that. Um, you talked about uh, compensation's role in uh, attracting and retaining. Mm-hmm. I get the attracting part, um, but I've heard many times that it doesn't have a strong role in retention. What's your thought on that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and when I um, say that it, it's important in retaining an employee, um, I would say, I would caveat that and say it is a part of it. Even though I'm in compensation, um, I do believe that in terms of retention, uh, things like career opportunity, things like mm-hmm. work-life balance, things mm-hmm. like, you know, your simple relationship with your colleagues, those are all what I would consider, you know, more key drivers, if you will, in, in retaining employees, but compensation has a part in, in, in that. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think um, compensation from the point of view of, do you feel like you are fairly paid? Mm-hmm. Not only just internally, but as you think about the market, um, we mm-hmm. know nowadays uh, there is so much competition out there and things like LinkedIn, um, there's mm-hmm. so much access for companies to target individuals. And we know that key talent is always being approached. And so, you know, if, if you aren't competitive in your pay, um, you will be susceptible to losing uh, key talent uh, for those mm-hmm. that are willing to pay higher. And so mm-hmm. uh, you're absolutely right. Um, it's not the, the, the only thing or even mm-hmm. what I would consider the main thing in retention, but mm-hmm. I would say it is, is still a key part of, of retention. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, Talking about base compensation. So what is, what are we talking about when we talk about base compensation? Right. Yeah. So when I think about base compensation, I'm really thinking about at the end of the day, what are you taking home at that is guaranteed, right? So okay. your base pay, salary, whether that's hourly, um, any anything that, you know, you know, you won't lose um, mm-hmm. as, as opposed to variable pay, which, which fluctuates and is not always guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what are the main principles of a good base compensation program? Yeah. So when I think about this question, I, 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 my, my mind uh, first uh, gravitates towards the, the fact that you need to have market competitive pay. Again, mm-hmm. in, the, in the world we live in now, um, yeah. 
there are companies that will be uh, reaching out to employees. And so uh, there's a real understanding of, um, of what your position's market worth is out there. Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, as a company, you'd want to ensure that um, you understand your market, you understand uh, where you sit in the market and, and you want to make sure that you're able to offer something that is competitive with, yeah. with those that are competing uh, for your talent. But I also think about just having a good structure, right? Um, having a good uh, comp philosophy and a structure underneath that to support that helps uh, because then uh, employees will know and trust that they're being paid fairly. So mm -hmm. In terms of having a good compensation program, it's not just the fact that you are competitive, but that people within your company feel like they're paid equitably compared to the people around them. And mm -hmm. I often think about the fact that you can offer someone, let's say $100,000, and you know they're ecstatic about that. And, and when they accept that offer, they feel great. But, you know, you know, a couple months down the road, let's say they are a top performer and somehow they stumble across uh, the fact that maybe someone in a more junior position is making 150000 Now that 100000 doesn't look mm -hmm. so attractive to that individual, even though compared to the market, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe very attractive, right? So mm -hmm. again, having a good structure uh, to me is, is important and a good compensation program. And finally, that really lends itself to good communication because you can have market competitive pay, you can have a good structure, but if your employees don't know that, you know, their mind can sort of run wild in terms of whether they're treated fairly or not. So when you have those two things in place and you're able to communicate it, um, not only from an HR perspective, but the most powerful communication would really be from their leaders. If you can train up your leaders to understand and um, really be able to communicate the uh, compensation program out to employees, mm -hmm. uh, that, that can be uh, a very powerful, I'd say. Can, so I just want to briefly go back to this, the, uh, the structure. You talked about structure. Um, what do you mean when you say that? Yeah, so I think it, it, it looks different in, in different companies um, mm -hmm. and it, uh, depending on the size of your company, you're, you, you know, you can have more structure or, or less structure. But in general, what I'd say it is, is a way for you to uh, group uh, jobs within your organization okay. that uh, are able to indicate in some way, shape or form um, what level they are at. Right. So as you can imagine, you know, within an organization, there are many different yes. uh, types of positions and it's hard to say, well, this position is equal to this position. Mm -hmm. uh, but ideally you would try your best in order to group levels of positions and come up with a salary range for those positions okay. um, to um, maintain sort of equity across different functions, okay. right? So for example, if you're looking at, you know, an accountant versus, uh, or accounting manager, I should say, versus, um, let's say, a marketing manager. Well, in essence, their jobs are very different. Uh, but how do you uh, do sort of a, uh, or come up with a structure which is able to compare them um, at, mm -hmm. at some level. And, and that's where mm -hmm. we get into job evaluation and, and, and job structuring, which again, we're not yeah. here to talk about today, yeah. but yeah. that is really useful in, in, in coming yeah. up with a uh, compensation structure. So what activities in um, compensation do you need to undertake regularly to maintain your strong base compensation program? Yeah, so I think the first thing um, you always start off with is defining your compensation philosophy, right? When you're okay. looking at, um, you know, what is your purpose of your pay and really understanding as a company, what, what are your goals around pay? Okay. Um, and your compensation philosophy, a lot of times should go hand in hand sort of with your business philosophy or your business goals as well. Okay. And 
and why it's important to come up with a con compensation philosophy is it is really what you go back to when you're you're sort of making any decisions around compensation structure. Um, so, for example, you know, if your philosophy is you really want to reward um, high performance, mm -hmm. uh, you'd likely want to then come up with a philosophy that focuses on variable pay. Right. So instead of guaranteed pay, like base salary, uh, you would put more emphasis on things like bonus or perhaps, you know, equity mm -hmm. where uh, individuals will get paid out uh, more based on company performance or individual performance. Okay. Right. That's why I, I feel, you know, the first first step is to come up with that compensation philosophy. And then after that, that's when you start undertaking, you know, your sort of your market reviews, again, mm -hmm. to ensure that you are competitive with those that are competing for your talent. Mm -hmm. And then How lastly, you, can I sorry, interrupt you there? How often do you have to do a market review? Yeah, so it, again, it varies, but I'd say most companies would do it uh, annually. Okay. Um, the, the, the market is changing so fast that it's, it's probably prudent to do, you know, sort of a across the board review sort of on an annual basis. But okay. of course there are those jobs that you might need to delve into a little bit deeper and, and then throughout the year, um, you know, you can you can do reviews for uh, particular positions and things like that. Okay. Um, okay, sorry about that. And then, so you had been, I had, these are the principle or the activities around a strong base compensation program and you were just about to get to number three there before. Yeah, and, and it, it touches on, you know, sort of my point before, it's educating your leaders and then communicating okay. this out, right? So yeah. again, uh, you're only as good as, you know, um, what your employees are sort of aware of. It is not easy, right? And in theory, um, it's, it's very easy to say, well, of course you want, good communication around your comp but of course there are <laughs> always difficulties not yeah. only around the, the pure idea of educating people around compensation but also just ensuring that the leaders in your organizations understand and are able to articulate it and I think that is um, one of the the main challenges okay so that I have that that is the question I wanted to ask you earlier but held off on mm -hmm. how do you do that how do you equip your managers mm -hmm. to, to have those conversations yeah so i think the first thing is you need to have a structure where you are um first of all consistent in right because if you uh, don't have that structure in place and you mm -hmm. aren't applying it consistently you can imagine a lot of confusion comes mm -hmm. up when you're trying to uh, educate your leaders uh, on, on right. what what it is. So I think the first thing is, again, having that consistent, strong, solid foundation of what your compensation program is, and that is tied to the philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. Again, so that people not only know what the compensation structure is, but why it's like that in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then it really comes down to partnering with the leaders. Um, and in, first of all, um, having them um, dedicate the time to understanding this, right. uh, which which also means you know they need to see a the value and they also need to uh, be willing to you know spend that time to 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 understand it to really understand it and to be able to articulate it. And I think Is that a top down um, thing, like where you know you just you say all middle management shall go through comp training of you know of some kind. Yeah, well, it, it's an interesting point because I think um, that's not always effective either, right? Mm. And it is sort of a mandatory, you know, training as you yeah. will, uh, because even if they attend, they may not really soak in the mm -hmm. information and, and B, mm -hmm. they won't see the value and importance of it. Um, but I think, you know, times are changing where, you know, leaders are recognizing that these are questions that they are faced with uh, mm -hmm. from their team members. And it's a discussion that is probably uh, more and more open now than it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I think about sort of the generation change, you know, when I'm thinking about sort of millennials and, you know, further on to, to the Gen Z group uh, that is growing up now, um, you know, there's nothing that's sort of 
off limits. You know, in that environment, you know, leaders are going to feel like, okay, this is something that I really need to wrap my head around mm -hmm. and I need to be able to answer because I don't want to be caught sort of a deer in the headlights, if you will, um, when that question comes up. So, um, but yeah, I, I think it just takes them uh, recognizing that, um, willing to spend the time and, and recognizing the value mm -hmm. um, of that as well. If you found this helpful, subscribe to see all the episodes and talk to us. What questions do you get about compensation? Tell us in the comment section below. And back to you, David. So what do you do when the market value for certain work rises? Right. So for me, one thing that I, I want to I highlight here is we talked about how compensation isn't um, sort of uh, the key driver in, in a lot of HR things, right? It's something where it needs to be done, uh, but there's so many other aspects of HR that can help in uh, maintaining and, and retaining and attracting employees. So I kind of want to perhaps go off strip, script here a little bit. Sure. Uh, but when I think about, you know, the market value for certain work rises, and perhaps you're caught in a situation where your budget doesn't really allow you to, I would really look at expanding your market of talent to look outside of, um, first of all, Vancouver, across Canada, mm -hmm. but even beyond that. And I think we live in such a global world now where mm -hmm. you're not limited uh, to just your local area. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I would look at. I would look at, you know, potential for in-house training, building out, um, I guess, longer uh, a longer term vision of okay if this is really a, a job or a function that is really hard to bring in talent mm -hmm. think about how to build up people in-house um, again i'm thinking about sort of the future of work and how agile mm -hmm. people are now mm -hmm. i think people also don't um, necessarily want to stay in the same job so how mm -hmm. do you cross train across yeah. other functions right? those are sort of off the top of my head, some some thoughts around it. I know. Can, it's I, can, top, I, can I interrupt here for half a second? Yeah. You know, if you're going to train people in house um, with a certain in demand skill set, are you basically going to train them to leave so they can go anywhere? Well, here here's where it comes down to um, building up sort of that um, credibility or or relationship with your with your own employees, right? And I think. You definitely want to um, build up um, a relationship with any of your high performers, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and I think for those individuals um, that notice that there are these opportunities within a company, that will cause them more likely to stay. Mm -hmm. If you if you choose not to build up these skills and give them the opportunity, they're likely gone anyways, right? So mm -hmm. I understand that there is that risk of. Yeah okay, you're going to train this individual up and they're going to find something else. But there is that risk there already. And I think your chances of retaining them, if you put invest in them, um, will go a long way in, in keeping them loyal to the company. I know I, okay, so, well, for one, I know I interrupted you on this, uh, what do you do when market value rises? Mm -hmm. um, was there anything else you wanted to add there? Um, maybe not. And then we'll just keep going. Yeah, may maybe just to quickly touch on comp there, I would just point back to, you know, our talk around compensation philosophy. This is where I think there needs to be a strong philosophy and structure, because when you are faced with these types of decisions um, and, and you need to to decide, you know, what path you want to take. Um, really, uh, to, to be able to apply it consistently, you need to go back to what is your philosophy around compensation? What is your philosophy in your business? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that will help sort of be your North Star in, in guiding you when you face these uh, tough decisions that come up. Mm -hmm. Is compensation philosophy, honestly, I don't think I've ever seen someone's compensation philosophy. Is this something that's written down and shared? Yeah, so I would say in most uh, publicly traded companies, mm -hmm. uh, they will have an executive compensation philosophy, again, with all the scrutiny around exec pay and all the public mm -hmm. disclosure that is required. I would say most um, publicly traded companies would have a document somewhere around their exec comp philosophy. Okay. Now, 
for those that are, you know, uh, taking the next step, uh, they would also have a comp philosophy for the general population as well. And, and so typically, yeah, you would find that sort of written down in some way, shape or form. Okay. So I want to talk about equity now. How do you balance internal equity amongst the employees in an organization? And maybe this gets into gender with external equity. So ensuring that uh, your jobs that are particularly competitive are competitive in the market. How do you manage that? Yeah, so I, I think to me, um, that is critically important to me. Um, mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, um, you want to ensure that you're treating all your employees fairly. And, you know, it, it's an interesting topic because um, you don't want your employees to be quote unquote punished for loyalty, right? And I think mm -hmm. it's interesting because, you know, when you bring up uh, an employee internally, oftentimes they may get more modest increases than uh, maybe an individual that, you know, jumps from company to company because it gets yeah. competitive. Yeah. And so I think this is, again, where the structure comes into play. If you don't have a structure, it's very easy to fall under that rabbit hole of just giving, you know, modest increases for uh, in-house and then realizing to in order to attract an external person, you need to give, you know, a higher uh, increase because you're trying to convince yeah. them to jump to another company. But if you have a structure that you can go to and you generally fit yourself into that, whether you are thinking about your own uh, employees or attracting someone else, it will really help you maintain that equity across and then the balance because you will know what the range is for that position, right? Mm -hmm. I think, first of all, you know, having that compensation structure that we've talked about uh, repeatedly here is, is, is critical. And then it's about following up with that because you're always going to be tempted and particularly the, the hiring managers are always going to be tempted and bring in their person that they, they feel like this is the person that's going to change the game yeah. for us. Yeah. We need to get them in no matter what. And yes. again, if they understand where the structure is um, and, and what the philosophy is, um, they're, they're less tempted to then try to attract the person solely on compensation. Right then that's where you go into the other aspects where you're trying to attract and retain your employees outside of compensation. The, those things that are real factors for people, okay. right? Yeah. And, and I, think, um, I think that's where, where it really comes down to. If, if you cannot draw a line in the sand when you don't have that structure in the first place. And if you have that structure, you can talk to the potential hire and say, well, unfortunately, due to internal equity this is what we can do this is all we can do but we really you know want to see you here this is you know all mm. the other things that we can offer you right and you can really talk about other things because again i'm just thinking about generationally um i think more and more at least this is my observation uh people care about um a good fit for them uh, mm -hmm. they feel they care about mm -hmm you know, mm -hmm. building a relationship with their boss and, yeah. and, and with their colleagues and they care about um, future potential and, and yes. career development. Yes. And I strongly believe people are willing to take perhaps less money in exchange for those things. And again, if you have a strong compensation program, you're able to really draw that line and, and focus on, on sort of the other pieces. Thanks, David. That was great. I really appreciated that. I've never spent much time personally in compensation. So especially that conversation around the internal and the external e equity and how to balance that, that was useful for me. I did an episode on pensions as well, and you might be interested in that. That episode is right here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.